And this one's Latin American. My presentation is divided into three parts, as most presentations are. Um, the first one is sort of preliminary observations, context, historical background, that kind of stuff. The second part is, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to try to define, not define, describe, and give examples of interventions of countries in other countries, with examples mostly of U.S. interventions in Latin America. Uh, specific examples with dates and, and other kinds of boring details. That's my second, second part of my presentation. Third part are three or four conclusions. The good news is that I'm not going to read the first part, which is the, the historical sort of background, my opinions about things in general. Uh, and I'm going to begin with uh, describing what we mean by inter what I mean by intervention and give some examples, mostly U.S. examples, mostly related to Latin America. Going back almost to the uh, early 18th century and the uh, early 19th century and the um, so-called Monroe Doctrine, which maybe was not the source of the problem, but uh, sort of uh, the delineation of the problem. Okay, to begin with, we should try to uh, Try to note uh, that the intervention of one nation, any nation, in the internal affairs of another is generally recognized as prohibited. That is, of the 200 nations, nation states in the world have made formal agreements, treaties, compacts, etc., and established institutions to enforce those agreements to respect the sovereignty of other countries. It is against international law, therefore, for one country to interfere in the internal affairs of another country. In other words, the countries of the world, have, all of them, have agreed to let others live as they choose. For example, if Mexico, which is not practiced capital punishment, was offended by the fact that the U.S. approves capital punishment, they're not allowed to invade our country or try to manipulate us into eliminating capital punishment. Or if Costa Rica, which does not have a standing army, objects to the United States having a standing army, and they find that offensive, they are not allowed to interfere in our affairs to eliminate the standing army of the United States. This is international law. It is endorsed by all and observed by few. Um, certainly not by ourselves. Here's a parenthesis. We sometimes make an exception for what is called humanitarian intervention. That's subject to definition, of course. Um, as an exception to what I've just said about international law. Uh, but generally, generally, intervention in others' affairs is illegal, it is even wrong. The U.S. does it, however, and gets cranky when others do it. Hmm. So, how does one nation interfere in the affairs of another nation? I have a list. One way, some of these are very simple, some of them are very uh, surreptitious and clandestine, that is secret. Others are outrageously visible. Okay, to begin with. One way is by influencing or distorting elections in other countries. The United States does this almost routinely. For example, in the 1990 Nicaraguan elections that replaced the Sandinista president, who we didn't like, with one chosen and financed by the U.S. government as an intervention of the United States. Another method of intervening in the internal affairs of another country is to promote internal disruption and political violence in order to destabilize the regime. As, for example, by the United States in Iran in the 1950s and Chile in the early 1970s. Another method of intervention is the imposition of economic disabilities on nations we don't like. 
for example, Cuba since 1961, um, until now, or currently Venezuela, or Nicaragua in the 1980s, etc., etc. Those are economic sanctions, sometimes they're called. Another method of intervening. We can damage another nation by not recognizing, not recognizing the legitimate president, such as Mexico's in 1921, the famous example which people don't remember now, all of you in Mexico. We refuse to recognize the election of Alvaro Obregón as president of Mexico, at least not immediately. Or by rec recognizing an illegitimate president, as we did in Honduras, in, in 2009, we recognized the arrival to the elected president who was back by the military. Another means, we sometimes support and finance regimes that we can manipulate, such as El Salvador in the 80s, or currently Colombia. These regimes are often conservative and sometimes abusive, but of course friendly to the United States. Our support of right-wing oppositions is sometimes clandestine, as in Nicaragua in the 1980s, or shamelessly open, as in Venezuela today. In the case of El Salvador during the 1980s, we supported a right-wing and murderous regime. Uh, another, another type of, uh, this is a unique one probably, of intervention, U.S. intervention, this is Panama which I consider to be a special case. That nation was a province of Colombia. It was part of the nation of Colombia. Until the U.S. decided to arrange for its secession so that we could build a canal there. <coughs> the Colombians wouldn't let us do it. So we, we simply removed part of the country and built a canal there. Some of our interventions are the direct result of military violence that is war. This is the way we seized the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. We still hold Puerto Rico, our largest colony, and we occupy a chunk of Cuba, a grievous offense to the Cuban sense of sovereignty, of course. Two more, two more uh, types of intervention. As an extreme, we can, can try to replace a nation's regime through subterfuge and clandestine support of opposition forces, as in Cuba in 1961, which failed, Iran in 1953, which succeeded, Guatemala in 1954, Chile in 1973, El Salvador in 1980, and Nicaragua throughout the 80s. These are places, times and places where we uh, secretly, clandestinely supported oppositions, which we preferred. In several of these examples, U.S. efforts attempted to unseat an elected president. Guatemala in 1954, Iran in 1953, Chile in 1973, these were all, they had legitimately elected presidents, which we, which we managed to, we contrived to manipulate matters internally in those countries to overthrow those legitimate presidents. And lastly, the last type that I can identify of intervention, state intervention, is the most extreme method. And that, of course, is direct armed intervention by U.S. military. This is the extreme. It doesn't happen often because it's not needed often. But the recent list includes our invasion of the Dominican Republic in 1965, our invasion of Grenada in 1983, and our invasion of Panama in 1988. Earlier examples were almost habitual incursions into Mexico, where we seized half of that country's national territory. And of Nicaragua, where unofficial U.S. forces hoped to make that country a slave-holding U.S. territory. Let's go way back. Okay. Uh, this is another sort of parenthesis another topic actually, how the United States media aids and abets U.S. interventions and aggressions is a topic for another session. 
Or you might pick up one of many books by Noam Chomsky that suggest manufacturing consent. This is really about American propaganda. Uh, one result of this history of U.S. intervention, the propaganda employed to cover it up, and the media's complicity in this subterfuge <coughs> and hypocrisy is that a fair-minded observer can become not just skeptical but cynical. It is too easily assumed that our leaders lie to us. Sorry to say. For example, just to speak personally, I find it very easy to assume that our leaders are lying to us about Venezuela. They've done it before. They did this Okay, my conclusion. Um, I have four points, actually. Uh, kind of conclusions that I, I uh, come away with from the, I think, accurate history I briefly described. Number one, this is the way countries behave. Nation states act like this. They are often racist, rapacious, and unjust to others. That is, nationalists. The U.S. is not less virtuous than other nations. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it is like other nations, perhaps no worse. We simply have more guns than the others do. My second conclusion. The U.S., like other nations, indeed like people in general, has reasons, pretexts, rationalizations for its aggressive and abusive behavior, such as, these are some of the pretexts the countries use, including ours, the need to defend ourselves against the British. Not anymore, but that was once the case. I speak historically. Or to defend ourselves against the Pope of Rome, or dark-skinned people, or Bolshevism, or Russia, or terrorists, or Muslims, or drug dealers, or hordes of Americans. We seem to need an enemy. You knew that already, of course. Besides, as a sort of universal justification, it is sometimes declared, and often believed, that the United States is the greatest country in the world, whatever that might mean. My third conclusion, I'm altering my scope somewhat, getting even a little broader, I guess. I suggest that the most spectacular recent U.S. interventions were Vietnam and Iraq. Spectacularism is my word. These resulted in the greatest bloodshed and the most pain to others. As interventions, both of these were failures, as you know. Two other interventions that were less bloody were perhaps more long-lasting in their effects. That is, our intervention in Iran in 1953 has poisoned relations between our two countries to this very day. And the Guatemala intervention of 1954 has only recently been formally healed after hundreds of thousands of deaths. Those deaths were Guatemalans first. And lastly, my last conclusion uh, is a sort of game or a parable. Uh, and I, I, hope you can, I hope I can make this clear. I want you to imagine the patriotic Venezuelan of whatever politics. It actually doesn't have to be a Venezuelan. Somebody who's not a gringo, not a, not, not a U.S. citizen. But imagine a patriotic Venezuelan. He might wish to lay the following indictments at the feet of the United States. That the United States electoral system is corrupt, based on money, the manipulation of the franchise, and a system that awards the highest office to the candidate with the fewer votes. That the U.S. is grossly militaristic with 800 bases in 70 countries, and military expenditures 
military expenditures more than Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, India, France, and the UK combined. That the United States wishes to expand its anti-Russian alliance to the very Russian border. Furthermore, that the United States, the most prosperous country in the world, tolerates scandalous inequalities of wealth and income and outrageous inequities in its justice system, especially in criminal justice. That the United States condones torture, abuses human rights, undermines the International Criminal Court, and refuses to hold its murderous leaders accountable. That the United States forbids others to do what it does routinely. Furthermore, that its current leader is racist, nationalist, and nepotistic, abusive of others, and the truth is not in him. These are imperfections with which patriotic Venezuelans might charge the United States. Still says my Venezuelan patriot, spite all these high crimes, misdemeanors, and gross failures to realize its promise, we Venezuelans forbear insisting on regime change in the United States or the replacement of the current U.S. president. But we also insist that he does not have the right to select our president. No, don't turn off the lights. No, because it's so, uh, so, uh, oh. so not always filming this. Well, maybe we can turn off some. Okay. Uh, okay, just to get everyone on, on the page. Venezuela has around 32 million people. It's a big country, 912,000 square kilometers. Uh, you can see, Guiana's east, Colombia is south, southwest, Brazil is straight south. So the part of the southern uh, part of Venezuela is uh, part of the Amazon. Uh, the capital, right, let's see, Caracas, right there. Uh, it's the north part of the country. Uh, the currency is the Bolivar, which I actually have. Now these are not Bolivar Sobranos, these are Bolivar Fuertes. Just the strong Bolivar. And Silverado means sovereign. And they actually changed over the currency in August. And we'll get uh, later as to what happened with that. Uh, GDP is around uh, $314 billion. And so that's about $10,000 per person. Uh, I know I said to start with 2000, but really to put things in context, you got to start in 1989. This is Carlos Andrews' parents. Is he takes office two weeks later? He he institutes economic reforms. They don't reform things. His prices skyrocket about 600 percent. And uh, the thing that the struggle finally broke the camel's back is. They, it, they uh, increased gasoline prices, which, uh, later I'll talk about how incredibly cheap gasoline is in Venezuela, but, uh, is that led to massive riots all across Venezuela, which uh, Perez sent out the military to uh, crack down, and upwards of 3,000 people died in the aftermath of the riots. And that inspired this 
guy. Here's Hugo Chavez. Um, is three years later, uh, Chavez led a coup against the Perez government. Uh, and incredibly, the government actually let him hold a press conference after he tried to overthrow the And he said, uh, it has failed poor Aora. And poor Aora became sort of the watchword for opponents <coughs> of the government. Uh, and it was uh, graffiti everywhere as poor Aora. And uh, Chavez was sent to jail for two years. Uh, when the new president came in, he let Chavez out of jail. Uh, so we get to 1998. Uh, Chavez had been reluctant to run for president because he thought it validated what he viewed as a corrupt political system. But people managed to convince him, uh, no, as you should run for president, you can win. Um, it's for 40 years, if you had two parties, you had the Action Democratic Party and the COPEI. To say they did not have their act together in 1988 is putting it mildly. Is they were, uh, and so basically what happened is you had three primary candidates, none of them was related to either of the major parties. Uh, Irene Sands, who was a beauty queen, she was Miss Universe. Uh, Enrique Salas Romero, uh, who was a businessman, and uh, Chavez. And about a week before the election is the opposition forces decided that they were going to unify uh, behind uh, Salas. And <coughs> so people went in and they thought they were actually going for Irene Sands and they wound up actually voting for Salas, because the, the party that supported Salas, uh, the party that supported Sands, changed over to Salas. It's a very, very bizarre election. Anyway, the results, Chavez wins, 56%. Uh, uh, Salas Romero gets 40%. I said, to put this in American context, is imagine that Bernie Sanders runs for president as an independent. Howard Schultz is running as an independent. And you get results like this. Bernie gets 56. Is Howard Schultz would get 40%. And the Republicans would get like 2% of the vote. The Republicans and Democrats get 2% of the vote. So that's now what? And more. I, what, did, what? Did it turn off? The fan motor. Oh, the fan went? Yeah, sometimes we get a problem with that.
uh, 91 centimeters of rain in 48 hours. Yeah, three feet of rain. Um, and much of Venezuela is built on hillsides. And so you just had massive mudslides that came down, destroyed entire villages. And uh, is the Red Cross estimated, and it's an estimate, uh, that there were 10 to 10,000 to 30,000. The initial uh, uh, the initial estimates were up to 50,000. And there probably never will be an accurate number because uh, so many people were just washed out into the ocean when the mudslides came down. Um, that's shortly after. And the why this is critical to uh, contemporary Venezuelan politics is that Juan Guaido is a native of Vargas. It's his family lost their home in the Vargas disaster. And he blamed the, the Chavez government for not responding quickly to help the victims of, of the Vargas tragedy. And so that built a long-term resentment of, of the Chavez government and led him to become a member of the resistance movement. Um, that's a shot. This is the coastline. And you can see, is there still big parts of the coastline? This was 2010. So this was 10 years later. Uh, and there's still big parts of the coastline where it's just devastated. Um, Okay, uh, 2000 election. Long story short, Chavez runs again. He actually does better in the 2000 election than he did two years earlier. In the National Assembly, uh, the Fifth Republic, which uh, was the Chavez faction, um, <coughs> they uh, picked up 92 uh, out of 165 seats. So they had very firm control of the National Assembly. <coughs> Um, so jump, jump forward to 2002. Uh, that building is Miraflores Palace, which is the presidential palace in Caracas. It is April 9th, Chavez goes on television, and literally he pulls out a list. The, the video of this is actually remarkable. Pulls out a list and says uh, to the, 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 the top executives at uh, the Venezuelan National Petroleum Company, you're fired, you're fired, oh uh, yeah, pull it Donald Trump, yeah. It's, it's basically, he said to these guys, I'm firing this guy and this guy and this guy at by name. And, um, and so that actually led to huge protests um, on April 11th and 12th. Um, Chavez was arrested and uh, taken out of the building. There's a great documentary called Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And the filmmakers, they were actually in the building as the coup was going on. And they literally filmed the coup as it was going on. And they filmed Chavez being arrested and let out of the building. And basically, the, the soldiers told uh, Chavez, um, we he says, you can go with us now, or we can kill everyone in the building, and then you can go with us. And Chavez was like, <coughs> um, well, what's remarkable is um, Chavez gets the word out, no, I have not resigned. This is a coup. It's an illegal takeover. Um, hundreds of thousands of people mass in the streets of Caracas. And less than 48 hours later, Chavez is returned to power. It's, it was one of the single most dramatic uh, moments in Latin American history. And it's the only time a coup has ever been successfully overturned. Uh, and uh, this is actually a monument uh, to the coup uh, that's on the bridge and talks about the bravery of the people of Venezuela who were defending 
uh, liberty of the Constitution, democracy, and sovereignty. Um, and this is a shot actually from the bridge. And there were snipers here in the hotel, and the police, the correct police, were actually firing at people from the bridge. So you got to imagine that this is what's absolutely jam-packed with people. The police are firing into the crowd, and snipers are firing into the into the crowd. Um, John, is this when you were there? No, I was there in 2010, which I'll get to. Uh, in the fall, in December, it was basically December, January. Uh, so December 2002, you had large-scale strikes, uh, which they were trying to destabilize the government, um, including the National Oil Company uh, and a lot of U.S. corporations. It's like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and it's. Um, but I mean, the big thing was obviously is the National Oil Company went on a strike, um, and uh, Chavez was actually able to weather out, weather that out. Um, so by 2003, is that's when the Colombian, uh, that's when the Bolivarian government uh, started the mission. And I can't go into all the missions, but some of the most important ones. Mission Robinson, um, which was uh, taught literacy, was based on a Cuban literacy model. And they, they were actually able to help hundreds of thousands of people become literate. Uh, they had 80,000 study centers all across the country. Um, and then Robinson too was to help all these people who had learned to become literate so that they could graduate sixth grade. Because there was a huge percentage of people who had not even graduated sixth grade uh, in Venezuela. Uh, Mission Rivas was another education uh, program, and that, uh, and that allowed citizens to complete high school. And then Mission Sucre uh, is basically, uh, it allowed huge numbers of people, like hundreds of thousands of people to go to college. And part of it was that they um, municipalized colleges. They made, they made like satellite campuses and stuff. So it was easier for people to, uh, to go to college. Um, Barrio Adentro was huge, provided health care. Is the Cuban government sent 10,000 doctors uh, in, the, in the summer and fall of uh, 2003, and uh, so, no, oh, they had over six million consultations every month. Excuse me, John. Um, yeah. Um, so, who owned the oil companies before that, and wasn't all these positive actions funded by? The oh yeah, it was very much funded companies? by the the oil companies. No, no. But so who so who owned the United States owned the oil companies. U.S. corporations own the oil companies. Until? Um, I'm trying to remember exactly when the... It was even before Chavez that the Venezuelan government took control of PDVSA, but... Uh, right. Uh, is, is, is realistically, is, it wasn't until the Chavez government that you, you had a government that was seriously interested in uh, social services like education and, and health care. Um, so they were they were taking that that money that was being funneled out of the states, um, their own oil money, and using it uh, for their own people. Yeah. Um, so Barrio Metro um, is one thing they did is they created high tech clinics all across Venezuela, and actually we get to that later. But there's a doctor from Barrio Metro. Um, so 2006 is Chavez is doing all these things for the people. Uh, so in the 2006 elections, he wins 62% of the vote. That's not Chavez. That's actually Barack Obama. And you can see he's giving out he's Santa Claus and he's giving out bombs as gifts. So yeah, the United States was not necessarily all that popular. <laughs> really, even when Barack was. Uh, one of the show. 
uh, that is Chavez, and uh, <coughs> is he was pretty much everywhere. Chavez was ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, and okay, getting to Karen's point about um, this is most of this is from my my trip in uh, summer of 2010. Uh, Petroleum to Venezuela is they are everywhere in Venezuela. And you can tell they're even on the garbage cans. <laughs> is so, so trash pickup brought to you by uh, the Venezuelan government. And yeah, and Chavez used uh, oil revenues to fund all these missions and social programs. Um, healthcare education, uh, food prices. Is subsidizing food prices was a big thing. Um, here's gas. Uh, Six gallons of gas for, uh, let's see, the price was $22.73. Oh, no, no, $220 bolivares. We went 55 cents. So that's six gallons of gas for 55 cents. Oh, and you're going, I'm a woman of Venezuela, right? Uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, right. <laughs> well, I mean, they pump it right out of the ground. So um, uh, this is one big thing uh, when I. This just opened when I was uh, down there in, in early 2010. It's a cable car system. And um, is, it goes from central, right, right downtown Caracas, up into the hills where the barrios are. And so it allows people to get from up in the barrios um, down to central Caracas and communicate and, and uh, get on the subway in. Whereas ordinarily it would, it's before, it would have been about a two hour bus ride. And now it's about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, you can see this thing is huge. Way bigger than you really need for a cable car system. And it's deliberately built so that you could make it a community center. Because you could put a clinic in there, you could put classrooms in there, uh, recreation facilities. Um, but yeah, it's, they, were, they were deliberately built to be community centers for the barrios. And that, you want to know what the barrios look like? Like I said, it's a huge percentage, of, it's a huge part of Caracas is built on hillsides. And there, yeah, again, that's, that's one, one thing that is interesting, is if you look over here, is you have a lot of high scale high rises and not very far from some of the poorest slums in Central, in, in, in South America. Brought to you by socialism. <laughs> yeah, is socialism improves your quality of life, and everything was socialist. This is here. I got a couple things that these socialist arepas, which who knows what an arepa is? Yeah. Okay. They're basically sandwiches. They're they're similar to empanadas, but they're open faced sandwiches. You can get them in Denosha. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, yes. So even even the sandwiches are socialist. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, is Che Guevara is big. Um, and there's um, John Lennon, yeah. Which not not surprised that uh, a man who a big hit. Certainly not in uh, Uh And this is uh, is of course the name of Venezuela is the Bolivarian State of Venezuela, and Simón Bolivar. And this is right in downtown Caracas. <coughs> 
Yes, if nature opposes, we will fight against it. We will make it obey us. <laughs> Which is certainly bold. Um, <laughs> Uh, but is is um, Bolivar is a very central figure to uh, the the history of Venezuela. Of course, he was born in Caracas, and uh, the, the house where he was born is very much had the whole great man uh, sort of shrine type aspect to it. Uh, he's buried in Caracas. Uh, is his tomb is actually within walking distance of the house where he was born. Uh, and um, certainly Chavez has ma Chavez made the philosophy of Bolivar very central to the revolution. Um, and let's see. Oh, this is government signs, yeah. Which the, the governor of Merida was uh, a, a Chavista. So you, everywhere you go, but every block there was like a sign going, Brought to you by the government of Merida, uh, and uh, there's Hugo, uh, and uh, Chavez was brilliant on television. He really was. He was an absolute master of it, um, and uh, one thing is he, he had a weekly call-in program. And people could just call up or whatever, you know, and and uh, and he would talk with them. Uh, so, you know, can you imagine if Donald Trump had a? That would actually be a little frightening. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, and and here's the other thing is uh, this is Chavez, and this is just a random TV uh, at a restaurant, and. It's not as if Chavez was the only thing on television. I mean, he was on television a lot. Is once I uh, flipped through the channels just to see it, he was on 16 different channels. Wow. Simultaneously, yeah. Uh, but it's, it, there were other things you could watch on television. But people actually watched Chavez because they wanted to watch it, because he was entertaining and they liked him. So. Um, <laughs> This is a little incongruous. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, is the background on this is there these two guys? One was obviously dressed up as Barney, and the other guy was the photographer. And <coughs> they actually had uh, it was like a uh, Hewlett Packard uh, photo printer, which they powered up using a gasoline powered generator. So. I, and um, and so the, is is um, when parents with kids would come by, they would say, "Get your picture with Barney." And so um, I paid. I think it was about it was either twenty or twenty five. Uh, so it was about five bucks too. And I, I is I put it out because um, the fact that. Venezuela had a thriving enough middle class uh, at that time that people thought nothing of just dropping five bucks to get a picture with Barney. <laughs> um, I mean, it was on the Sabana Grande, which is one of the night. I mean, it's sort of like the Rodeo Drive, of, but nevertheless. Um, okay, 2012-13, October. Chavez is reelected to a third term. Uh, he won with 55% of the vote, uh, and Chavez died of cancer uh, the next spring. And um, which actually is is people knew that he had cancer by the fall of 2012. They knew he was dying, and they voted for him anyway. So uh, so uh, Nicolas Maduro, the there you go, there's Mr. Maduro. Uh, there's another presidential election in April. He, he runs against Radonsky. He wins very narrowly, but he does win. Um, so just some background on Maduro. He was born in 1962, so he's 56. 
Uh, he started out as a bus driver. He was a union activist. Uh, he was elected to the Assembly <coughs> in 2000. Uh, as Chavez picked him as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and then, after about a dozen years in the government, he became the Vice President. He visited up here. Yeah. Very briefly. <laughs> so. Uh, and then, everything went to hell. I mean, let's, let's not be blunt. Everything went to is, <coughs> um, this is where the oil prices were under Chavez. 2015 is the price of oil fell to 49 a barrel. By 2016, it was down to 40 a barrel. Um, and so all of a sudden, the uh, Venezuelan government, which had been propping up all these social programs and much of the economy, because it has the world's largest reserves of oil, uh, suddenly finds its gross domestic product cut basically in half. Um, is I mean, oil is the resource. Is it makes up over ninety percent of uh, of Venezuela's exports. And so, so when the oil economy fell through the floor, it just I mean, it was an absolute disaster uh, for Venezuela. Uh, then of course. The bottom fold out is, uh, these are the elections 2010, is the Chavez party won by a fairly decent margin. Um, then 2015, um, because the economy was in such disastrous shape as the opposition uh, came in, uh, they picked up 45 seats and the Chavistas lost, 41. So, I mean, it was just a wipeout. Uh, so Maduro is facing an employee economy, and he has to deal with an opposition legislature. John, yeah. why did the prices fall so much? Why did the uh, OPEC? Oh. I mean, oil's a commodity, and OPEC basically. Um, Uh, so then, on top of it is is we got John Bolton. Yeah, uh, you can boo if you want. Um, is so the Trump administration is the the Obama administration had put some sanctions on, uh, and there were some were serious, some were but but I mean they put some sanctions on this But as Trump piled on a huge number of sanctions is by the end of the of, uh, 17, they had 63 new sanctions. And uh, it's debatable as to exactly how much it cost Venezuela. Is six, million, is, uh, 6 billion is the low number. Uh, could be much. So uh, we get to May of last year. Is Maduro decides to move up the presidential election from December to May. Yeah. Um, and you can see, is he had a turnout of 46%, which is the lowest turnout in the modern history of uh, Venezuela. Uh, and Maduro, he won. Actually, it's even more ridiculous than that, but um, is. So. In the aftermath of that is the opposition accused Maduro of fraud, of rigging the election. Uh, the Organization of American States, which is a very conservative organization and basically run by the United States. Uh, now, on the other hand, the European Union, which is not necessarily that friendly to the United States, uh, uh, did also basically have serious doubts about the, the uh, Maduro's election. So we jump forward. Okay, hyperinflation. This is November, the Bolivar was at 65. By mid-December it's at 300, by mid-January it's at 900, and uh, as of the start of February, 3,200. 3300 3300 
Um, and the, the crazy part is the official government rate is actually higher <laughs> than the black market rate. <laughs> yeah. Is that the black market, I mean, when, when the government is actually, they're basically giving money away at this point. Um, is, I'm not quite sure what one step beyond worthless is, but is the, the Boulevard Silverado is approaching it. Um, and that's, you can see, is this was, the blue line is the Boulevard Fuerte, which was rapidly estimated. And so basically they said, no, we're going to have a new currency, the Boulevard uh, Silverado, uh, which traded at 1,000 to, yeah, it was uh, one, uh, one Silverado to 1,000 <coughs> uh, It didn't help. Uh, and this is the new money, which has the same pictures as the old money, but Um, now here's some of the things that did happen under uh, Chavez and Maduro is if you look at where education was um, 2001, 26% of people completed high school. By 2015 it was at 56. Girls completing primary school, 37%, 88%. It's, it's actually slightly higher than uh, boys finishing primary school. Uh, and the complete primary school went from 60% up to 87%, and that's largely as a result of them actually getting girls in the school, the finishing school. Uh, infant mortality is, when Chavez took power, uh, it was 26%. Is by the time I was uh, in Venezuela, it was down to 14, 14.3 per thousand. Uh, last year, it was back up to 25. And part of that is because all, all of these clinics that, that, that they built is they don't have the resources. So they don't have the medicine. Uh, there was one case where, uh, I mean, I hate to use apocryphals, but it's, this was a true story. I mean, uh, uh, one hospital where uh, they had two premature babies, and they only had enough electricity to run one incubator. So they actually had to make the decision. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that is where a lot of medical facilities in Venezuela are at now. Is, uh, so you're, you're seeing a significant rise in, in for mortality, uh, maternal deaths. Um, um, living below the power line, this is... 98, 47 percent. Might have actually been higher than that, but 2015, it was down to 20 percent. John, can, can you, maybe you can help me. I'm trying to get the timeline, okay? So, so this didn't happen just because the oil prices fell, right? No, it, well, it's, 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 a big, it's a big part of it is because the oil prices right, fell. Right. It's obviously, it's, it's oil is the but primary resource, and so when oil prices fell, it was just a disaster. Uh, but then the U.S. government came, comes in, and they impose massive sanctions, and so that's so you know really an insult to injury. Absolutely. And so they really didn't have a chance to uh, readapt their economy at all. No, no, no. Is I'm just trying to lead to the fact that that they could have taken care of some of this themselves, but we didn't let them. Um. So could Maduro? Possibly, um, and so we get to this year is January 10th. Maduro is sworn into office. Is the very next day the national legislature uh, says that he is illegitimate. Is two weeks later Juan Guaido claims that he is the president of Venezuela, and the United States government, a lot of Latin America and a pretty good chunk of Europe have sided with Guaido. Um, is Maduro has the Russians, the Chinese, Iran, and Bolivia on his side. So Why are they siding with him? 
Um, is elected. Yeah. Is no, Guaido is not elected. I mean, is is no, no, technically Guaido is elected, but um, here as as um, I think he got twenty six percent. As, as Elena pointed vote. out, is is one point of. If you want to know where the United States government is coming from, the simple fact that Elliot Abrams, I said, you know, what is, is what, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer's not available because he's dead? I mean, you know, um, is, yeah, I mean, it, it is, is Elliot Abrams, who is legendary as a hatchet man in Latin America, I mean, he, he propped up uh, Rios Mont in Guatemala, is, he covered up the, the human rights abuses in El Salvador, including El Mazote. Um, you know, he, he sided with the Contras down in Nicaragua. It's, you know, pretty much any nasty, horrible thing that the United States government did back in the 1980s down in Central America is Elliot Abrams has his fingerprints all over. And so Donald Trump chose this guy is to uh, be the special envoy uh, in Venezuela. Uh, here's our friend Mr. Gua uh, Guaido. Is, he's young. He was born in 1983. So he's 35. Uh, he has an engineering degree. Uh, he went to grad school in D.C. Uh, which is where he actually met some of the, the folks who were not fans of the Venezuela government. Uh, is he goes back to Venezuela in 2010, uh, forms the Popular Will Party with uh, Leopoldo Lopez. Lopez gets sent to jail for attempting to overthrow the government. And uh, when Lopez gets sent to jail, he says, Guaido is my right hand guy. And so he's the one who takes over. And his rise has just been staggering. Is three years ago he's elected to the, the uh, legislature, uh, by 2017, he runs the uh, Comptroller Commission. By the uh, start of 18, he's the majority leader, and then by the end of the year, he is the president of the National Assembly. So in the space of three years, is this guy rose to the leadership of the National Legislature. Um, Why, why was it accepted? So um, my guess is, is part of it is that. Um, what was the question? Is, my question was why was why, it so why so bad? bad? Is, is part of it is that he um, is an acolyte of Lopez, and so Lopez did definitely push his career, um, even from jail. Um, is Lopez still has substantial influence among the opposition in, uh, in Venezuela. Um, and um, I think a couple of reasons. Prop, propped up? I mean, he's propped up, right? I don't know whether he's necessarily propped up. Um, I think Guaido has some strong advantages as a politician. He's young, he's fairly good looking, uh, he's a pretty good speaker. Um, you know, so um, Has he been backed economically and publicly by the United States government since he got in there? Um, economically, I'm not so sure. Um, he's paying for the post is, but is where we're at right now is things are on the getting worse before they're going to get better. Still, <coughs> is Literally 48 hours ago, there was an armed confrontation <coughs> on the Colombian-Venezuelan border, and uh, Venezuelan troops actually fired at civilians, uh, and five people were killed, um, and, and a lot more were wounded. Um, so, is this on this? Oh, oh, okay. no, it, I mean, it happened. It did happen, uh, and um, so these are Maduro which that it, it almost it, 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 it almost ruined the uh, the, uh, uh, the the concert band, Luis Fonsi.
<laughs> Which that's that's how surreal things are getting is that Richard Branson had a concert with Luis Fonsi uh, in support of the uh, Venezuelan opposition. Yeah. They really saying, and you really concerts. can't make this up. Two really really concerts, concerts, right? Concerts. Yeah. yeah. Two concerts, right? Yeah. 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 One on one side of the border, one on the other. Right. <laughs> and uh, so where we are at now, okay, um, is um, we have no war on Venezuela.org, which if you want the latest on what's going on, it's a good site to visit. They have a petition you can sign. Uh, contact the Trump administration, contact Congress is first and foremost the, the, the message. No military action against Venezuela. No U.S. military action against Venezuela. That's, that's the biggie. Uh, the other stuff is end the sanctions on Venezuela, is end the efforts to destroy the Venezuela's economy, stop that in Guaido, um, and then respect the rights of Venezuela to self-determination.